Welcome to another edition of Lakeville City Council Wrap-Up. During this program, we will highlight agenda items presented to the Lakeville City Council at their June 19, 2017 meeting. The first highlighted item on the agenda was item 5A, a presentation by Panorama of Progress Vice President Greg Haggerty. My name is Greg Haggerty. I'm the uh, Vice President of Thank Lakeville Panaprog. <laughs> and hello, board, and uh, you folks over there to the left, hello. Um, Jackie couldn't be here, uh, so I thought I'd step up and just say hi, and we want to thank you for your support throughout the years for Panaprog. I'm sorry I didn't have anything prepared, but um, we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, I think the Panaprog planning is going well. Like I say, thank you for helping us out with that. Chief Long, I want to thank all your guys in the trenches, along with Mr. Petrie, those guys that put out everything for us, and all you folks that work behind the scenes. Sorry, I get a little nervous. And uh, I just want to thank all those folks, too, because uh, I don't think we get to thank them enough. Um, Tell us about the cruise route, Greg. Oh, yeah, we decided to change the cruise route again. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here we go. What, we wanted to, what I wanted to do was add the new and add back in the old route, because we have folks down south that really missed seeing the cars come by. We have a couple of properties out there that had parties of 100 people you know, that like to see the cars come by on cruise night. Well, when we had construction on Dodd, we went north. With the southern construction on Dodd, we went north, and we found out that was a good route, too, because more and more housing is going up in there, so more and more viewership for the people right here in town. But then we didn't want to forget about them. And since it's our 30th, I went out and tracked the mileage. It's 30 miles. <laughs> okay, give or take. That might be alternative miles. But uh, it's like 26.8, so it's pretty close to 30 miles. So we're going to take that southern route again and go down to 86 and come back in on Dodd and add that into the whole cruise route to make it a 26.8 mile route. And that uh, is when? Pardon? And that cruise night is when? It is Friday, July 7th. Okay. Got that right? Yeah, at what time? And it's at 6 o'clock at night. At 6.30, we will release the cars from the uh, staging lot. So technically, it starts at 7. And uh, we'd like to, I would like to invite you up and the police chief. I don't know that we're going to give the police chief awards and things this year because it was so complicated. I can bring them back if you guys are disappointed. <laughs> no, seriously. I think you need back. to do that. He looks kind of disappointed. Yeah, I agree. Well, it was just, it, I you think could you never need find to do it. Council awards, too. I, I do plan to be there. Um, okay, good. So if you would, if you would like a mayoral award, I'd be glad to do that. All right. We can probably. I can work with the police chief. Maybe he and I work together. No, if you'd like me to bring it back, I can, and that gives you. I think an you're hearing me say that, around. aren't you? <laughs> okay, we'll get it back for you. I'll, I'll have the trophies made up. If you're invited, also. The chief and I will uh, co-partner on this deal. And of course, Mike Meyer, Mr. Meyer. Yeah, or... we'll bring him along too. Yep. Is he and, here? Uh, they'll get to Where is he? out their choice of vehicles. And, uh, <laughs> there he is. But they can't Sorry, drive Mike. him off the lot. You got to leave him there. You can choose them, but don't drive him away. Um, so, yeah, I'll work on getting those back, and we'll try to find a way to get those drivers because it's just so hard to find the guys because they wander off, you know. Mm. So, makes it complicated. Uh, I'll let you take over. All right. Thank you. And my name is Mike Jetrick. I've been on the Panaprog board since 1995 and uh, continue because it's a great organization and uh, I like to think we put on a, a great festival every year too. So on uh, behalf of the Panaprog board for 2017, I have some thank you packages for the council and the mayor and like to hand those out. It includes a, a section of the Panaprog guide and a couple of uh, buttons and a certificate of appreciation for each of you for what you do for us. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. You. Why don't you go ahead and come around? And while he's handing that out, I'd like to try to give you a heads up. I'm president for 2018 and 2019. In 2019, the Pulse 210, VFW Pulse 210 turns 100 years old. So we'd like to really do that year up in 2019. Cool. So we're going to start working early on that. So you may see things coming in just to give you a heads up. Thank you. you like to start well, actually, early. Uh, as mayor, I am a little bit aware of that. And I, okay. I, um, I think that uh, it's important for us to keep working on that with you folks to yeah. celebrate that. Have you been in contact with the VFW also yeah. about the wall? Yes. That will be a neat thing. It's supposed to be a big draw. Since you've mentioned the wall now, you might as well tell everybody what it is. They are bringing in a replica 
a scale replica of the Vietnam Wall. And I don't know the park name behind Despatch. I think it's J.C. Park. Mm -hmm. J.C. Park. And what we want to do is put the wall up, the replica of the wall, so people can come by. Uh, the VFW said in places past, there's been over 500,000 people that have come through. So you can expect people from all over coming through to, to look at the wall and do that. And what we'd like to also do is have a big parade of all military vehicles to honor our veterans. So that's something we're working on really heavy with the VFW. Yeah, this is all still in the works, so it's not a yeah. firm or final commitment yet, but it is something that's being looked at, and I think it'd be a great addition to our celebration if it can happen. So. Yep, so we'll, we'll work on it. Thank you folks very much. Is there any the next highlighted item on the agenda was item 5B, a presentation by the Lakeville Public Safety Foundation. Uh, tonight the Lakeville Public Safety Foundation is here to present the Lakeville Police Department with a new multi-use trailer. <clears throat> the Public Safety Foundation has been a great partner to public safety in Lakeville. The foundation has grown from providing a few dollars for our canine program to now delivering a $30,000 multi-use trailer that is in the parking lot. I hope you had a chance to at least look at it or seen pictures. Uh, the trailer was needed to fulfill several voids in our operation. It will serve as a shelter and relief for our officers working large-scale community events such as Panaprog. Currently, our officers do not have a place to cool down, get out of the rain, heat, or strong sun. It will allow us to Allow us a place to complete reports, review plans, leave valuables, and use the restrooms, one of the most important things. Uh, it will give us a place to take citizens that may need privacy to file a police report, uh, or waiting, uh, waiting place for family that has misplaced a child, or then become separated. I don't think they usually misplace them. Uh, <laughs> it will be used uh, also at police calls that may need significant crime processing. It will carry their equipment that is now scattered. It will provide a safe place to store the items processed, and some that may need to be at room temperature to process. It will be used as a mobile command post when our emergency operations center is activated for events such as a tornado, train accident, or plane crash. We will no longer be using the trunk of a car or a picnic table for our strategies. Uh, we feel very good about the benefits of this new trailer. Uh, Deputy Chief Cornman, along with the foundation members, worked for many months to find the trailer that would fit our many needs. A simple thank you to the foundation effort seemed to fall short but we value our partnership with the foundation and their continued work to meet the grants that we request. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Shannon Corlett. I am the president of the Lakeville Public Safety Foundation. With me, I have almost all of the board members, so Penny Zern, Matt Manley, our vice president, Stephanie Shear, secretary treasurer, Kirsten Specht as well. So in 2016, we held five events. In 2017, we're holding the same events um, that we did the year prior. Um, and we received tremendous support from the community, from businesses um, that have really helped the foundation grow. So we're excited um, to use some of the funds to donate the crime scene trailer to the Lakeville Police Department. We feel that this new piece of equipment will be with the department for many years and will come to be a great asset to the officers as they need it. So thank you for letting us present tonight and thank you for letting us donate. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Council, comments, questions? I would just say, um, I know all of you do a great amount of work to make this happen, and I know that you do more than one event, and thank you for caring so much about the public safety and those in blue and red here, so thank you. I'm just so grateful for your commitment to our city, and I really appreciate the hard work you guys do to, to raise the money for our folks, so thank you. Davis? I know you have a big fall fundraiser. Do we have that locked and loaded? And where it's going to be okay we have three events coming up so thank you for asking we have the glow run august 5th which will be held at the fire station um, and it is a 5k and a 1.25k run walk so over 250 people last year i think a lot of you guys were there so thank you so that's coming up on august 5th and we have the police and firefighters ball which is our largest fundraiser um, that's on September 8th at Brackett's Crossing. So I'll be here in the next couple weeks to give you guys invites for that. And thank you for the support for that. And then we have the Police and Fire Memorial Golf Tournament. That'll be at Crystal Lake Golf Course, and that is on September 30th. It's a Saturday. So thanks for asking. You bet. Thank you very much. The, this uh, foundation is not that old. No. And uh, could you just share a little bit about um, 
how many years the foundation's been in existence, and if some if people would want to get involved, what are ways that they would do that? Yeah, absolutely. So we became a 501c3 in 2014. So we are in our third year um, where we have been meeting officially as the foundation. We've done some fundraising in years past, but under the foundation was 2014. Um, always looking for volunteers, always looking for sponsors um, for all of our events. So if you are interested, you can always reach out to any one of us at our website, um, which is lpsfmn.org. So always looking for support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why don't you folks walk around so we can shake your hand? Thank you very much. The third highlighted item on the agenda was item 5C, the fire department quarterly report presented to the council by fire chief, Mike Meyer. Mayor, council members, I'll start with our first Quarter report for 2017 with our mission statement. The Lakeville Fire Department is dedicated to serving the community through the protection of lives and property by providing public safety education and professional emergency response. And first part of that is our fire inspections that we complete. So in the first quarter, we had 139 commercial inspections that we were out, uh, four daycare inspections. These are new daycares to the, the community and 16 burn permits that we issue throughout the, uh, our response area. And the one thing I always like to note on the uh, inspections when we go out into a business is that th that's our opportunity to educate the business that we visit. If there are violations, what they are, what those are and how to correct those. Looking at call numbers for the first quarter, you can see total call volume on the left side there. We had uh, 343 calls, which is about 70 calls up from 2016. So we are seeing a gradual increase in our calls. Uh, and looking to the, the right side of the screen as far as breakdown by stations, and that explains a little bit of the increase there. You can see the stations one, two, and three are pretty even in numbers. Station four is slightly behind, and the duty crew responded to 127 calls. So that's where we're seeing some of that increase. Breakdown of call types in the first quarter. Medicals are always our majority of the calls that respond to. Vehicle accidents, good intent calls, and false alarms are the other three. Uh, the good intent calls make up if we're canceled in route, so if we get called out for whatever that call type is and then we're not needed, we're canceled, so that's a good intent call. Or if there's a smoke in the area, and we find that it's a wreck fire, uh, that's a good intent call to us. So just to explain what that means as far as why that's such a big number. Some of the major incidents that we had in the first quarter, looking at the top left picture, uh, is the propane truck rollover that we had on Kenrick, south of County Road 70. So one unique thing about this is not only did we have a propane truck in the water with propane leaking, but we had to also extricate the driver out of the vehicle. So made it a little bit difficult, and we actually had the SOT team, our SOT uh, team from Dakota County come out and assist us with that being it's a hazmat call also. What does SOT mean? Special operations team, so as all the cities within Dakota County uh, participate or have members from their agencies, police, fire, EMS, that are members on that team that receive special training. Uh, the bottom left picture is a vehicle accident. Obviously, these are from first course. We got a little snow on the ground. We had some uh, accidents out on the freeway when the snow fell. The middle picture is a garage fire that occurred in January, and this was a result from cooking in the garage. The top right picture is a vehicle fire that extended to the front of the house or the garage there and got inside the garage. And the bottom right picture is a vehicle rollover. Some of the fun things that we do get to do, so in February we hosted our annual banquet. Uh, we awarded Todd McNamara Firefighter of the Year on the far left, and then to the far right is Jay Couser, who was Rookie of the Year. We had 168 families attend the banquet. Just want to highlight some of the training that we've completed in the first quarter. Uh, in January, we out at Valley Lake, we held uh, water rescue training, which all firefighters were required to attend. And then the far right picture there, our class of 2016 completed their live burn training up at our ABLE facility. Now this is a joint venture with or it's, we call it the ALF Academy, so it's Apple Valley, Lakeville, Farmington, all of their recruits. We all go through the same training and class, and then we bring them up to ABLE for their live fire training. The bottom left picture is we brought in a national speaker by grant funds. Uh, Chief Latsky is the author of Pride and Ownership. So not only was this that we hosted this as Lakeville, but this was also spread. Uh, we had firefighters from the metro area attend two classes that were held. And then in March, we had uh, auto extrication training out at AAA Auto Salvage in Rosemont. So we have a partnership with them to use some of their uh, salvage cars for our training purposes. 
out in the community, we had uh, some Station 3 firefighters that went up to the Fight for Air Challenge and climbed 30 floors in their gear. Uh, one of the firefighters that uh, brought two of his kids to actual walk with them or climb the stairs with them. That completes my first quarter report. We thank you for your dedication and support to the Lakeville Fire Department, and I will stand for any questions. Questions, comments? Not seeing any. All thank right. you so much for your report. Certainly. I'm going to move to the next step. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Right. I can ask our officers to come up. So we're going to recognize some of our officers this evening. Uh, and I'll start with our Assistant Fire Chief, Todd Selner. We've had a lot of changeover as far as movement within the ranks, so uh, I want to bring them all up and recognize them. Chiefs to the left and stations one, two, three, four, moving across. If your families would like to come up with you. Recognizing Assistant uh, Fire Chief Todd Selner for completing his one year probation. And then also promotion of two district chiefs, Tabor Aiken and Steve Galinsky. Station one's captain, Derek Garboski, Garboski uh, Lieutenant Todd McNamara, station two, Paul Miskaman and Eric Scari, Station three, Todd Munson, Dan Lowe, and station four, Chris Horniak and Brian Jacobson. And I'm gonna do a oath with them and then their family member is gonna pin their badge on them. So this is repeat after me. I state your name. Sorry, raise your right hand. Oh, sorry. Start, over <laughs> Start over here. I state your name. I do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that, I that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the state of Minnesota and, the state of Minnesota. and faithfully discharge the duties of fire officer of the city of Lakeville in the county of Dakota and state of Minnesota to the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. If your family member would like to pin your badge. Congratulations to everybody. Thank you. The next highlighted item on the agenda was item seven, a public hearing to consider an ordinance amending the park dedication fees. Over the past few months, the Parks, Recreational, Natural Resources Committee, Finance Committee, and City Council have reviewed and discussed increasing the residential park dedication fees. This included the valuation um, of the current fees, the estimated market value of unplatted land, and also the review of the 10-year park dedication fund plan. At the May 22nd council work session, the council did direct staff to schedule a public hearing to increase the residential park dedication fees by 3% effective July 1st of this year. State statute does require that the establishment or modification of fees to process land use applications must be adopted by ordinance after a public hearing is considered or conducted. Um, the 3% residential park dedication inf increase um, would result as follows. For a single family lot, it would be $3,895 per lot. Um, townhouse, which is your medium density, $2,650 per dwelling unit. And multiple family, which is your high density, $2,032 per dwelling unit. So at this time, staff is recommending approval of the ordinance adopting the fees in summary publication of an ordinance which results in approval of a 3% residential park dedication fee increase. Item 7 was adopted by the City Council. The next highlighted item was number 8, the City of Lakeville Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for year ended December 31, 2016. The presentation started with Lakeville Finance Director Gerilyn Erickson. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present the 2016 Annual Financial Report. Um, first, I want to say some thank yous to a number of people. Uh, first and foremost, to Julie Werner, the Assistant Finance Director. She led the audit with the staff in going through the um, audit field work and actually compiling the comprehensive Annual Financial Report that you received. And then I would also like to extend my thanks to the senior accountants, David Lang, Laura Miller, and Tom Nesseth. They also play a key role in 
preparing audit work papers, working with the auditors directly, and so forth. And then, in addition, my the rest of the finance staff that throughout the year are working on you know compiling information and so forth, just on a regular basis, making sure documentation is complete, processes are followed, and so forth. And then finally, um, um, the departments, all of the departments, staff, other departments in the city that. Um, when they are submitting their information to the finance department for something to be paid or to receive funds, that they're very diligent in making sure we have documentation and so forth. So uh, thanks to everybody that's involved with it. Um, it does take about six months following the year end to actually go through the audit and prepare the reports and submit them to the state and then come before you and present the financial results. Um, tonight, we do have um, Mr. Chris Knopik, a partner with um, CLA, Clifton Larson Allen. You'll recall that CLA is a new audit firm auditing our books. Um, prior to that, we had MM Care for a number of years, so I'd like to welcome Chris. And he has a presentation tonight, a PowerPoint presentation on the financial results for the city. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Gerilyn, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, and the council for allowing me to come to the council meeting and present the audit report for this year. Uh, as Gerilyn mentioned, I do have a brief presentation prepared for the council meeting tonight. As we go, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me as we go. You do not have to hold them till the end. As far as we have some required communications that we have for the audit, the first one that the city should be aware of is you are receiving an unmodified or a clean audit opinion for 2016's audit. That is the best the city can do. A little bit of a different or odd terminology, but an unmodified is a good opinion for a, any kind of an audit. And then there is a separate governance communication letter as well that the entire council will receive that has a, it's about three or four pages. It's basically a form letter that auditing standards require us to provide those charged with governance, which would be yourselves. Um, it goes through, talks about if there are any changes in accounting standards, if we had disagreements with management, difficulties in performing the audit. If we had any of that stuff, you would be well aware of it uh, before tonight. So that's why I don't spend a lot of time on that at a council presentation. As far as internal controls go, we do look at the city's internal controls that are in process or in place. We not only look to see if they are working properly, we make sure that they're effectively working. So uh, this could be through a couple different formats. It could be through actually doing a full test of controls where we use that to then rely on work that we do in other parts of the audit, or we just look at a couple of transactions in a specific cycle to make sure that they're operating effectively so that if the documentation and the work papers say that a department had a signing off on an invoice, we will pull disbursements or something like that to ensure that that process is actually taking place. Uh, through that process, um, we'd, we'd let you know if there are any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, we had none. So that's very positive for the city. That means that you have a very strong process in place that you're, as Gerilyn had mentioned, that the department heads and everybody are doing their due diligence when they're turning in invoices and everything like that, making sure they're getting all those approvals that they need. Also, as part of the audit, we do look at the Minnesota Legal Compliance Guide, which is a 25-page uh, document that the State Auditor's Office uh, issues annually. All auditors are required to go through that for any kind of municipality or po political subdivision within Minnesota. And this is a, it's a large document where it's basically yes, no, not applicable in how we test them. Um, as we went through that, it covers areas from cash and investing to contracting to debt. Uh, there's seven areas in total, and we did not have any exceptions in that part of the audit as well. So very positive there. These next couple of slides, we're actually going to be looking at some of the financial results for the city. And the, the first one here is looking at the revenues for just the general fund. So it's the main operating fund for the city. And one of the, the positive things that I would like to point out here is that the when you look at the graph here, the, the bottom dark blue line, that's your property tax piece. And even though the total revenues are growing for the general fund, the proportion that makes up your property taxes are actually decreasing a little bit. It's sliding more up into a charge for service type thing. So you're, the users are paying for things. So it's showing less dependency on property taxes, which is very positive for the city. You're not as reliant on those. And then the other items on there, your license and permits, intergovernmental revenues, those are all pretty consistent outside of that. So, As far as the general fund budget results go, uh, total budget for the general fund, you're at 6% over budget. 
really the biggest driver on that was license and permits and then charges for services in the general fund. So that's really just a uh, kind of reemphasizing the, the growth that the city has been experiencing here over the last year or a couple of years at least. So you're increasing those. The city is budgeting conservatively, which is, which is the prudent way to go about those categories when they are so dependent on what the economy and the surrounding areas and communities do. As far as the, the general fund expenditures go, so this is looking at the other side of the equation, where is the dollars going for the city? And one of the things on here, as you can see, the, the graph is increasing a little bit each year, but what it's showing is that the proportionality of the different functions, whether it's general government, which is your administration, finance, planning and zoning, those pieces, the public safety, public works, they're staying proportional. So you're not having to shift funding from one category to the other. So you're, even though your budget is growing a little bit each year, you're still spending the dollars in the same proportion each year. When we look at the budgets on the, on the expenditure side for the general fund, you're a little over a million dollars under budget and really the, the biggest two drivers on that were the, the public works, that portion was under budget and that was just a driver of the street maintenance that was under budget this year and also some personnel costs. On the parks and rec side, very similar, the personnel costs for the park maintenance area was down this year as well. So those were the two biggest drivers on that. As far as looking at the, the fund balance for the general fund, the city currently has a policy in place that the fund balance should be 40 to 50% of the next year's budgeted expenditures for the general fund. And at the end of the year, the city was just slightly over that 50%, so, but you are meeting your, your fund balance policy there. So very positive there. As you can see, it, it goes through 2012 through 16, and then the far right-hand column is the 2017. As you can see, the, the, um, the cash balance piece was just left off just because that is looking into the future on that. But you can see where you're meeting your fund balance policy. As far as looking at the, the utility funds, so these next couple of slides are going to be looking at the enterprise funds, so it's the, the utility and then the liquor side of it. And really, this kind of shows a couple of different things. It looks at, you know, what are the operating expenses doing? We're also breaking out a proportion that is related to depreciation, comparing it to what your operating revenues are. And then the, the bar that, or the line that goes across the bottom is helping to depict you know, where your... Um, income before depreciation is. So it kind of helps you gauge how much of your depreciation you're covering. For 2016, you're covering about 51% of your depreciation. So um, basically what that says is some of the, the current users are paying for some of the system as well as it's some of it's gonna be paid for by future users, which goes off the philosophy that in the utility fund, you know, the, what the water and the sewer and the nature of it, the assets that are in there for the most part are very long lived assets. So it, does it make sense? Philosophically, where the current users should be paying for everything or some that should be split out over time. So uh, nothing real concerning there. I did put a few other highlights as far as where you're at compared to 2015 and then also where you're at compared to the peak side as well. This year, the operating revenues did increase about $300,000. Uh, really, that was just a combination of some increased usage as well as increase in rates during the year as well. Uh, cash and investments at the end of the year were about 1.6 million, or sorry, cash provided by operations. So that's when we look at the operating side of the activities of the, of the utility fund. So the receipts coming in from customers, the day-to-day -day bills of what it takes to actually operate that fund. When you look at that at the end of the year, the operations provided about $1.6 million in cash flow for the city. What the city then does with that is that's, where you, that's the money that the city has to one, put in some in reserves, but then also that allows you to make any principal and interest payments you have on any debt in there. It also gives you the opportunity to make the capital improvements as well. So that goes to a couple of different things. The total cash and investments for, for the utility fund at the end of the year were about $8.8 .8 million. When you compare that to your total expenses, you're about $12.6 million and about 75% of a, a year's worth of expenses in there. So it's a very stable fund. It's very good to see. You got some cash reserves built up if you need to. Um, and it also shows that you're not having to uh, take on huge amounts of debt in those funds as well to continue operations, which is very positive. As far as the, the liquor operations for the city go, um, I got a couple of different lines on here. The, the bottom one is the gross profit percentages of sales for the city. As you can see, it, 
kind of peaked a little bit there in 2013, started sliding in 14, then it dropped in 15, and now 16, it's starting to come back up again. And then the top line that leaves one year off of that, that's the seven county Twin Cities metro area average for off-sale off liquor sales. Um, 16 is not included on there because that information is not going to be available yet for several, several months, but it gives you an idea of kind of where the city's liquor operations are compared to the seven county metro area. And then I also included just a couple of other uh, communities around the area too, as far as you can see where you compare to them. Keeping in mind these are cities that just have off-sale operations. We're not including anything with on-sale. Um, so you're just a little bit behind them, but the big thing here is if we can keep that trend going back up the other way, um, that's a very positive thing. The, the nice thing is, though, is that the liquor operations, you're still able to transfer over a million dollars out of the fund. So you're doing what you need to with the liquor operations. That's one of the, one of the goals behind liquor is to, uh, if the city is going to be in that business, making sure it's providing money that you can transfer out and use for other, other things within the city. So that's the very positive thing there. Looking at just some uh, trends that we're seeing in the, air, in the area as far as taxable market values, and then we also have one on tax, um, tax rates as well coming up. But really the big thing here, uh, 2016, the taxable market value for the city was about $5.8 billion. It increased over $270 million over the prior year. Um, 2017 was actually increased another one up to $6.2 billion. <coughs> so that's actually going to be the peak on this graph as far as the 11 years that it shows on here, so that basically uh, is showing you the amount of growth that the city is experiencing here over the last several years as well. Um, so very positive in there. When we look at the tax capacities and the tax rates for the, for the city, typically there's an inverse relationship because as your property values increase or decrease, usually your tax rates go the opposite of that. And that's pretty typical what you're seeing in 2010 through 16. Uh, prior to 2010, it, as you can see, it, it went a little bit backwards there where they weren't exactly inverse of each other. Um, the tax rates do include both the operating and the debt levy for the city, and that your, your tax capacity for, from 2015 to 16 increased about $2.8 million as well. And then your tax rate for 2017, that's 37.51%. So um, as you can see here, when we go to this next slide, this is looking at your tax rates as far as 2015 to 16. Then we also compare it to the statewide city average and then also the seven county metro. And we include the county, the school districts, the special taxing so you get a better idea of where the total tax rates are. Knowing that your school district rate for the city of Lakeville is blended because you have three different districts that affect the city. So the, the number that you can really control is that top one, which is the city line. And as you can see, that's below the seven county metro area and it's below the statewide average. So that's, that's very positive. Uh, you're, able to, you're controlling what you have control over, which is what we like to stress to, our, to the cities we work with. Control what's in your control. Um, as far as looking at just some overall just comparisons to other statewide averages, this is looking at revenues on a per capita basis uh, for similar size cities. And unfortunately, the data we get from the state is a pretty wide range. So it's anywhere, cities anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000 in population. But as you can see, it gives you the idea of where you're, where you're going as far as your revenues. Um, your revenue per capita this year increased about $99 over the prior year, and really that's the big thing is the charges for services and your intergovernmental revenues. Intergovernmental revenues are a combination of your, the police and fire aids increased, which are all just um, formula driven from the state. But then on top of that, the intergovernmental revenue, there were some additional just grants in there this year, which really fluctuate from year to year. So those numbers can tend to get skewed a little bit, but the other ones, you know, consistent property taxes, Tax increments are really just a, a factor of what kind of districts are operating in the city there, so that one's really um, not a real big driver there either. So, And then this is looking at um, working with city staff. We got a list of what the city likes to think as comparable cities in the area. As you can see, we listed them out anywhere from Apple Valley to Blaine, Invergrove up to Maple Grove, uh, Plymouth, that area, and you can kind of see where the city compares to other um, the, the comparable city average. And you can see for the most part, the, the city is, um, you know, kind of mirroring where the, the, your comparables are with the one exception is that charges for services line. 
which is really a big factor of uh, the park dedication fees, some of the, the connection fees that also go into the charges for services there. So other than that, uh, you're pretty much on, on par with other compar comparables for the city. As far as looking at the expenditures per capita, um, as you can see here, this is very similar as well, looking at the, the city here for the last three years and also that statewide average. And I, I should mention, the statewide average is actually a year behind as well just because of the, the timing of the data. But you can see where you're, where you're at compared to other cities. And really the biggest drivers uh, on, the, on the per capita base on the current expenditure side, which is the public safety, which is really just a factor of how many dollars on a, you know, the per capita basis that the city has to spend for your, your basic services, your police, your fire, all that type of stuff, and be able to provide, the, provide what you need. On top of that, um, the other big driver that you really see on here is mm -hmm. capital outlay. The, on a per capita basis, the city spent $622 this year on capital outlay projects. So that's um, all of the different road projects, any of the, anything else that goes into that line. So it's equipment purchases, everything in there, compared to that statewide average, which is $286. Um, and really, that's, that really is a, a good way to show the amount of growth that Lakeville is experiencing because that's what that number is a driver behind that. Um, it's, it's either going to be a growth-driven number or it's going to be a factor of what kind of condition your existing assets are in. And for Lakeville, it's, it's a growth number. So that's showing you why it's at. Um, and then your, your debt service on a per capita basis is just a little bit above the statewide average, but that is also a factor of the of the growing area as well. It, you, have to do, you do have to take on some debt in order to make, those, make the growth happen sometimes. And then similar on the revenue side, we also have the expenditures on a per capita basis that you can see. And as, you men, as I mentioned before, you know, you're pretty much mirroring that same trend with that exception as that capital outlay number where the city is spending significantly more dollars just because of how the community is growing here. As far as, as a conclusion goes, really the, the big thing here to take away is that the general fund, you're meeting your fund balance policy, so you're strong there. You, you're just over that 50% threshold that the policy states. We had no internal control findings, no legal compliance findings that, um, are, in, that are in writing here, which is awesome to see. Um, it goes to show kind of uh, the, the process that the city has in place. It's, it's a very strong, strong environment here. Enterprise funds, you're providing cash flows from your operations. The, the liquor is very profitable. Like I mentioned, you're transferring a million dollars out of the liquor fund to other areas of the city. You're not covering 100% of your depreciation in the utility fund, but you're covering over 50%, so that's very good as well. Um, and then last year, the city did, uh, was awarded the Certificate of Achievement in Financial Reporting by the Government Finance Officers Association. That was 28 years in a row that the city has received that award. Um, it's, a, it's a very good reward. Not many cities get it. Um, so it's a, it kind of gives uh, Gerilyn and the rest of the finance department, their staff, um, what kind of work that they do to put into and see so you guys get that nice uh, financial statement at the end of the year. Um, then outside of that, uh, just real briefly, uh, a couple of accounting standards that are coming out over the next couple of years. There, there really isn't going to be a, a huge effect on the city. The, the one that will be hitting it, the city is the statement 74 and 75 just because that's looking at the post-employment benefits again. That's a standard that came on the books probably six, seven years ago with Statement 45. The GASB Board, with Governmental Accounting Standard Board, decided um, about two years ago they should relook at that. They're going to make that one a little bit closer to what the pension standards look like now. So it's going to add a few pages to your notes and your financial statements. It's going to affect how the liability is valued. But the, the city is working with the actuary to make sure that all gets um, worked out properly so that it shouldn't be... Um, a real big push for the city. Um, looking at your current uh, valuation report that the city has in place, it's going to increase your liability by a little bit, but relatively your liability is pretty small to start with. So, outside of that, I'd be open to any questions that anybody would have. The next highlighted item on the agenda was item 9, an ordinance amending section 3227 and section 112315 of the city code concerning dynamic display signs and summary ordinance for publication. Thank you.
you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. Uh, we have an application that was initiated by a property owner within the city uh, to amend sections of the zoning ordinance and city code regarding dynamic display signs. Uh, this application is brought forward by JAS Lakeville Properties LLC, which is the property owner for Schneiderman's Furniture located at 16751 Kenyon Avenue. Uh, that property is zone C3 district, located just north of the County Road 50 uh, interchange on the west side of I-35. Uh, that property is also within the freeway corridor sign district. This is an ordinance uh, or a special sign district included within the zoning ordinance uh, that was established to uh, allow for greater signage uh, area and height uh, to attract business and support business activity on the I-35 corridor. Uh, it's established in our comprehensive plan for the city that this area is to be promoted as the primary commercial corridor for the city and these provisions uh, are consistent with that implementation. Uh, with construction of the new 110,000 square foot Schneiderman's store on this property, the uh, business approached the city to construct a sign uh, that was 116 square feet in area, 17 feet in height, and included a primary dynamic display element or a changing uh, graphic display element. The zoning ordinance uh, addresses dynamic displays through specific performance standards uh, that have been adopted starting in 2010 and modified moving forward. Uh, what is allowed for Schneiderman's under the freeway corridor district is a 400 square foot sign up to 50 feet high. Uh, but within the zoning ordinance currently, the dynamic display would be limited to 40 square feet, 20 feet in high height with a uh, seven second change uh, factor. What the applicant proposed uh, was amendment of the freeway corridor district to apply the standard specifically to uh, stores that are 100,000 square feet and larger consistent with existing provisions of the freeway corridors uh, sign requirements allowing dynamic display up to 120 square feet, 20 feet in height with one 24 hour change uh, per day uh, as their proposal. The other performance standards that apply to dynamic display signs within the city would be unchanged. Uh, from what currently exists in the zoning ordinance that requires a monument style construction as shown on the uh, exhibit where the base is the width of the, the display area. Uh, there are also location requirements established by the zoning ordinance including a setback from residential districts and also frontage to collector and arterial streets. Under the city code provisions there are also operational standards that include uh, requirements for static displays, a single message, no uh, animation incorporated and then also limitations on brightness to ensure that uh, there's no additional distraction. The Planning Commission had extensive discussion regarding this proposal. Uh, first at a work session on March 16th, uh, the property owner initially approached the city with the uh, concept of applying for a variance. Uh, the Planning Commission did not support that approach being uh, that the state statute and criteria established in the zoning ordinance for approval of variance uh, wouldn't be satisfied by a request to allow a type of signage uh, that could be applied more generally to other properties within the city. However, the Planning Commission was supportive of the request uh, to accommodate uh, the sign as being proposed by the property owner and advised them to seek a uh, text amendment, uh, which they brought that application forward uh, for consideration by the Planning Commission at their meeting on March 24th. Uh, the Planning Commission, again, very supportive of the request and the need to accommodate uh, the interest of the business to attract regional patrons off of I-35. Uh, so they're recommending approval of the ordinance that's in your packet this evening by a vote of seven to zero. City staff has drafted findings of fact supporting that amendment, uh, the final clean version of the ordinance without red lines included, and then also a summary ordinance for publication. And city staff is available for any questions you may have. Item nine was adopted by the city council. The next highlighted item was number 10, a resolution calling a public hearing on proposed assessments for Holyoke Avenue improvement project 1704. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, many of these slides you have seen before, so I will go very quickly through them. But we'll start off uh, talking about the project a little bit. Of course, everyone's aware of the project scope for the Holyoke Avenue project. and includes a mill and overlay of the street, a complete sidewalk replacement in the business district, streetscape improvements in the business district, and then through the whole corridor streetlight replacement. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Looking back, the project background, we started uh, with some of our meetings with the DLBA almost two years ago now in August of 2015. Uh, the council authorized a feasibility report in November of 2016. Uh, you accepted the feasibility report in February of this year. 
Uh, we had a public hearing and ordered the project in March, and then we did open bids on June 2nd for the project. So quickly, a little bit more about the project. Of course, there was extensive analysis, uh, specifically in the business district, with work from the DLBA subcommittee that was formed, looking at the sidewalks, the streetscape, streetlight replacements, and gateway signage. Uh, here's just a little uh, kind of elevation look of what the streetscape improvements are from um, scored concrete patterns, raised seat walls, some landscaping amenities, street lights, those sorts of things are, are what's included in the business corridor. Street lights specifically, and the council already approved uh, an agreement with Excel Energy for street lights, but we'll be replacing the existing acorn fixtures with these LED lanterns uh, through most of the project and then Cobra type fixtures or the taller fixtures at intersections and they will all be like I mentioned LED. Signage was another big component to the project. Um, everything from a city message sign out here in front of City Hall to a wayfinding sign just uh, to the south of City Hall in the southwest corner of County Road 50 and Holyoke. Then some gateway signs uh, at the business, to, uh, kind of the bookends of the business district, and then also some county approved wayfinding signs out, uh, out further off of Holyoke. So just a little bit of background on the signage. The city message sign is it will be paid for with city communications funds. The north wayfinding sign, again, just south of he here at City Hall, will be uh, paid for with Dakota County TIF and the CDA rig grant that the city secured. And then we have the gateway signs, again, kind of the bookends. It's all really part of the streetscape component um, attached to and affixed to some columns and some landscaping there. That is a combination of Dakota County CDA TIF funds, the CDA rig grant, uh, City of Lakeville TIF District Number Three, and also special assessments from the uh, property owners in that business district area, and then the county-approved wayfinding signs, which the city has been working on for a while, will be uh, uh, paid for with city funds, relatively minor cost. So, projected costs: uh, the feasibility estimate was two million three hundred forty-eight thousand dollars. The bid results, we did, uh, when we solicited bids, we did have four bids for the project, uh, was $2.9 million. So you can see the bids were slightly higher or significantly higher, but uh, we'll get into kind of why that was. Um, a number of things in the scope of the project were added as we go through. So if you see the breakdown of costs, uh, we have the, the largest amount is the street and storm sewer improvements that are assessable at $1.3 million. Uh, some street and storm sewer improvements that are not accessible at one or $176,000. If you, uh, the council recalls, we're also doing some improvements at 210th Street, specifically on the south side of 210th and Holyoke, where we're doing some improvements following a study that was conducted back in 2010 along with the school district to improve some um, issues there with delays and, and safety issues. Uh, we also have some uh, parking lot improvements at the Art Center that was not factored in to the feasibility uh, study. So we bid it as part of this project. So that's one of the reasons, uh, that's one example of where the numbers are a little skewed. We also do have some sidewalk improvements at Market Plaza. Again, that wasn't part of the feasibility uh, report. Uh, that's just some, some maintenance improvements uh, adjacent to ACE hardware. Electrical improvements, there was a minor amount in the feasibility study for electrical, but as the council's aware and as the design process went along, some of the electrical improvements and the scope of those improvements changed slightly. Uh, gateway signage, um, again, we had that. I went through some of the gateway costs uh, and wayfinding signage. And then street lights and indirect costs are the last. And the indirect costs, of course, are the design, the engineering, the financing, bonding costs, all those sorts of things are included in that. So that brings us to the $2.9 million number. So how does that break out for project funding? And you can see the differences here with, with some of the stuff from the feasibility report uh, and some of the changes. Uh, you can see property taxes, of course, that's the one part that, that you would have seen in your budget that goes from about 1.1 million to 1.29 million, about 11%, almost 12% increase. 
Um, but then you can see some of the special assessments for streets and signage where they were at compared to the feasibility study. Both of those went down fairly significantly. Uh, street light operating fund also went down um, as part of the project from 456 to 400,000. Communications fund was slightly up. That includes uh, the sign here at City Hall. And then we had some other costs, what you see that weren't included, like I mentioned already at, in the feasibility study, the pavement management fund, that 37,000 is for the work that's gonna occur at Market Plaza. Uh, the building fund, um, that's the parking lot improvements and some storm sewer improvements at the Lakeville Area Art Center, which were budgeted in the building fund, but not included in the feasibility report. And then you can see some of the additional TIF funds, the RIG grant, and then um, the Lakeville TIS, TIF district number three and how those funds would be applied uh, to come in at the total number. So with that, I wanted to take a moment to look at the assessments because the purpose here is not only to declare the costs, but uh, set an assessment hearing. So as you can see across the board, short of, of one very minor increase, assessments all uh, decreased. Uh, the, the increase is for the single family unit rate and that's from 202nd Street or County Road 50 down to 207th Street. The feasibility estimate was $1,948. The bid result is $1,967, so not quite a $20 increase, less than a percent increase, so very close. Uh, the front foot uh, rates for the business district, two different areas uh, or two different items. One is for the street improvements, one is for the signage improvements, and that's from upper 206. They're about Babes, south to 210th Street. You can see the feasibility estimate was at $155.53. The bid result is $135.44, a decrease of almost 13%. And the front foot uh, signage improvements for that same area, the feasibility estimate was at $5.56 a front foot and was reduced to $3.54 a front foot with the bid results, which is nearly a 37% decrease as well. Uh, then looking at the single family unit rates for the remaining parcels um, south of 210th Street, feasibility estimate was at $1,053, bid result $960, about almost a 9% decrease. And then lastly, we do have the front foot assessment rate from 210th Street south to 215th 215th Street, again, the estimate was about $11 per front foot. It came in at $8.65, about a 21% decrease there. So overall, very pleased with the uh, way the proposed assessments are working out and uh, the results of the bids from that. As a reminder to the City Council and everyone that might be listening, street improvements based on our city assessment policy 40% of the project costs are assessed. This includes street, sidewalk, streetscape, signage, storm sewer improvements. Uh, properties that are benefiting from the improvements are the ones to be assessed. Street light improvements are not assessed. That is paid for th by city uh, street light operating funds. Uh, again, with the city assessment policy, uh, properties are assessed on a per unit basis for residential properties and uh, property zone for residential use. Um, and then uh, properties that are zoned for a commercial use are assessed on a front foot basis, as you can see by the breakdown of some of the assessments. So assessments will be considered uh, at a separate hearing on July 17th, 2017. And then assessments, uh, if the council certifies the assessments and decides to move forward at that, here, at that point, they can be paid without interest um, through November 15th of this year. And the assessment period for this project on all different uh, areas is a 10-year assessment period per our city's assessment policy. So the remaining schedule for the project, of course, we're here tonight declaring the cost and setting the assessment hearing. The assessment hearing, again, is scheduled for July 17th. If the council chooses to move forward at that point in time, we'd also be asking you to award a construction contract at that July 17th meeting. Construction would begin almost immediately after. As you can recall, we've always talked about construction starting after Panaprog and trying to wrap up as much as we can before the Arts Festival in September. Um, so that work would occur from July through September 2017, and then we would be certifying assessments to the county by December of 2017. 
With that, we'd ask the council to consider a resolution calling for the public hearing on the proposed assessments for city improvement project 17-04. I'm happy to stand for questions and also I failed to introduce Ms. Monica Heil with WSB and Associates, the project engineer and project manager for the project. And Thank she you. would be happy to answer questions as well, I'm sure. Item 10 was adopted by the City Council. Those were the highlighted items presented to the City Council at their June 19th, 2017 meeting. If you have any questions or comments regarding these items, feel free to call City Hall. The number is 952-985-4400. Thanks for watching this edition of Lakeville City Council Wrap-Up.